Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, lesson 38, we'll take a look at some of the techniques for identifying microservices. In general, when we identify microservices, there's three kind of approaches. There's a top-down or function-driven approach, which really says to take a look at the overall functionality of the application, decompose it, and form services from there. And it's been my experience that just using this approach will lead you down a bad path in terms of not having the right level of granularity for a service. Another approach is a bottom-up or a data-driven approach, which says don't look at the functionality, but rather take a look at the data and then form services off of there. And like the function-driven, uh, this is a good start, but also leads you down a bad path. Orthogonally, there's a third approach which says, ignore the function and the data, just take a look at the kind of requests that are made in the system and form a microservice off of each of these requests. Um, uh, this is also a form of something called API-first or API-driven development or design. And this will get you pretty far but then you'll hit a brick wall as well. You know, the secret to identifying microservices is to do all three of these. And let me show you the flow. Now, remember the cogs are functional, uh, the cylinders are data, and then that glyph image uh, of that person is the business request. So here's, uh, here's the steps involved in identifying microservices. First, um, look at, notice that this is a function-driven top-down approach is to identify coarse-grained functional areas of the application and then through decomposition start breaking those apart into coarse-grained microservices. Now this is still a function-driven top-down approach. I bet you're saying, but Mark, you said this wouldn't work. Ignoring all the other dimensions is where we run into trouble. And notice the key point here is to create coarse-grained microservices. We start out coarse-grained and then start analyzing that service because the third and necessary step is now a data-driven approach. And so a lot of times I get the question as well, Mark, when should we start involving or taking into account data in our services? And the answer is right away. Once we've identified some coarse grain services, what we're doing here is we're mapping those tables, those database tables to services. Now, I'm showing cylinders here. Those don't necessarily mean uh, databases, but rather groupings of tables. And so we start mapping those services to those data tables, and notice what we have. That left-hand service requires data from um, both of those kind of tables, the right-hand service from those group of tables, but look what we have. Um, I call these crossovers. In other words, service two, that service on the right-hand side, needs data from that first service as well. And so there's kind of this combination thing. All we're doing at this part is mapping. We're not taking any action because step four in the process is now to refine that service granularity. And notice this is both a top-down and a bottom-up data-driven approach. We've got both the cogs and the cylinder there. And now what we do is, is notice that we, when we say refining service granularity, see that service on the left-hand side. Now what I've done is I've found a very clear, quote, seam in that functionality. In other words, it did A and B. A used one group of tables. Functionality B used another group of tables, and there was a clean separation. So consequently, when I refine the granularity, and here it goes, based on the data, I was able to create two microservices from that. However, notice that right-hand service from step three to four. Here, I was not able to find that clear seam. So that right-hand service does A and B and C. But the problem is all three of those functions, A, B, and C, all require the groupings of data. So consequently, I was not able to split up that service. This kind of demonstrates how data does, in fact, influence the granularity of your microservice. Now, we still have this crossover problem right here. And so that's where we get step five, which is now to create the service dependencies. Notice how I took that crossover. That crossover, and I'm circling it in red right here, now means that, in fact, what I have is inter-service communication. And this, in my opinion, is pure evil because we start to have performance issues, scalability issues, deployment issues, testability, reliability, fault tolerance, availability. Um, pretty much every illity you can think of is impacted um, every time we communicate between services. So now at this point, we analyze 
those interdependencies because we will always have some interdependencies. But if we have too many, watch this. We then retrograde back to step four, which is to refine the service granularity. And then we go back to creating service dependencies. And so I, in fact, may, due to those illities, I may go back and retrograde to step four and actually combine those two right-hand services, therefore eliminating that inner service communication. You know, a lot of this has to do with uh, latency, um, how often I'm communicating. If every single request has to go to that other microservice, it might seem kind of silly to have that as a separate service. Now, a lot of teams finish up right here, and that's the other problem, because look at all the symbols around here, the cogs in the databases. Do you notice one missing? And it's perhaps one of the more critical aspects of defining services, and that is identifying the orchestration level. Now, notice the glyph image here. This is that request-based approach. So here, notice that I've got a level of orchestration between these two services based on another microservice. In other words, um, get all customer data. Uh, I'm going to have to go into another microservice that then orchestrates, hence now we have more inter-service communication. But here's the key point. Analyzing the kind of requests that are made to those microservices does impact the granularity. For example, you see that red circle on the far left-hand side, identifying orchestration level. Well, look at those two left-hand services. I usually use the 80-20 rule. In other words, if 80% of the requests to that functionality are independent in each of those services and only 20% of those requests need to be orchestrated, this happens, then that's acceptable. However, if it's reversed and 80% of all the requests require a coordination or orchestration between those two left-hand services and only 20% go individually, then watch this. I retrograde all the way back to step four. I therefore refine the service granularity, probably combining those, and now I go back to step five. I look at the service dependencies that I've created based on that granularity, either combining or separating, and then I reassess that orchestration level. I continue this loop, everybody, um, for pretty much the life of that whole application. Every time we get new features, new services, I always go through these particular steps. And this will avoid a lot of heartaches, a lot of problems with mm, uh, these big ball of distributed mud type of applications and also give you the right level of granularity in your microservices. For more information, you can go to Software Architecture Monday, where this actual video is housed here, and there's uh, lots of lessons every single Monday that I do in Software Architecture. And also check out upcoming events on my website, developer2architect.com, to see where, uh, where I'm speaking at user groups, <coughs> conferences, and also training uh, around the world. So this has been Software Architecture Monday, Lesson 38, Identifying Microservices. And stay tuned next Monday for another lesson in software architecture. Thank you very much.